Hello everyone. Oh, sorry, a bit loud. I guess it's time to start the talk. Oh, thanks. Um, so, of you reading the, yeah, especially the FreeBSD source commit mailing list, probably know me best for working on the Spark 64 port and also generally on Ambilos beloved device drivers, but that's not what this talk is about. Apart from working on FreeBSD, I'm currently also a master's student and a scientific staff member of the University of Applied Re uh, Sciences in Regensburg. And as part of that, I had to work on a research project um, involving so-called Ethernet um, microcontroller reference design boards. And these boards turned out to be rather interesting. I decided to delve some more into them um, beyond what was actually needed for the project. And that's what this talk is about, finally. So before I start, I still want to set some things straight. First off, I'm no way affiliated with the Ignite GmbH, which sells these boards. I just regularly bought them. I don't get no money from them. Also, for me, it's rather um, yeah, unusual to give a talk without writing a paper. Um, so I ended up with having a lot of information in the slides, and the whole talk is a bit more workshop style. I hope that's OK for you. Um, also, this is my first regular talk at a BSTCon, a free, a Euro BSTCon, so I hope, hopefully you bear with me. Um, as you can see here, I have a FreeBSD logo here, but the talk isn't solely about FreeBSD, but it's at least uh, in some way FreeBSD-centric, so that's why I kept the logo from the slide templates. So to finally begin, this is a yeah, rather intentionally crowded slide to Introduce some abbreviations. Uh, it's from another talk I gave on yeah, introduction to uh, embedded system prototyping. Probably for this audience, I don't really need to explain these abbreviations. Um, except maybe for if you're not familiar with embedded systems with JTAG, which is um, debugging interface, um, but also used for flashing microcontroller boards. And an alternative to that is in system program in-system program via an SBI interface. So what are these? Oops. Yeah, Ethernet boards. That's a whole family you can see here. That's so now a bit unhandy because I have to put away the mic. That's how they actually look like, so get a, get an idea of the size. That's a name sort of implies they all have uh, Ethernet tags on them. Yeah. You may wonder, there's no Ethernet 4. I don't know what happened to it. There's just one, two, th three, and five. There never was a four. So Ethernet 1 is uh, designed from 2004 and uh, still sold. It costs about um, 85 euros today. And uh, Ethernet 5 is uh, the 2011 design currently sold from 185 euros. Um, obviously, that's way more what, for example, a Raspberry high costs, but also the targeted audience of these boards is different than that other boards. For example, the Raspberry Pi doesn't even have an, an RTC chip, a real-time clock chip on it. I'll talk about uh, a bit more about the hardware of these, bar, uh, of these boards in the next slides, but uh, some things noteworthy here is the Ethernet 2 is basically the same as the Ethernet 1, except for more RAM, uh, RS485 interface, and uh, it's also certified for the full industrial temperature, temperature range from, I think, minus 40 to plus 85 degrees Celsius. Yes, that's right. And um, the Ethernet 5 is really interesting. It was the first member of this family to also have uh, USB connectors. It's uh, possible to power it over Ethernet. It also has, has things like an uh, um, image sensor interface. And it's also certified for an extended temperature range. In general, uh, the operating system intended to be run on these boards is called NATOS, which I'll introduce later. Um, however, for the Ethernet 5, the Ignite GmbH also uh, is distributing a Linux uh, kernel and yeah, user land based on the Angstrom distribution. Uh, but the necessary, necessary patches for Linux are not in the Linux mainline tree. Okay. 
So comparing these, uh, Ethernet 1 and 2, I said, as I said before, are based on the same microcontroller, which is an Atmega uh, 128 from Atmel AVR architecture 8-bit. As you can see here, it's up to Ethernet 3. It's uh, rather tiny in RAM and flash, so really uh, intended for embedded systems. And uh, with uh, Ethernet 5, uh, which finally is a um, yeah, rather powerful ARM9-based microcontroller, they put a lot of, uh, sort of, uh, relatively a lot of RAM and, and flash there. You can also, yeah, for example, run Linux and other interesting operating systems there. Uh, in terms of frequencies, 1 and 2 are running with about 15 megahertz. Uh, if you don't know, need exact uh, board rates, you can also run a SEM at 16 megahertz. It's not three clocks at about 74 megahertz, and the five is 180 megahertz. Uh, flash on the Ethernet five is yeah divided into three parts, or there are three components. An Intel internal one used uh, solely for the um, first stage bootloader. Uh, four megabytes external one for uh, configuration data, the so rest of the bootloader, and uh, NATO S applications as well as kernels. And there's another one gigabyte flash chip intended to be used for a file system. First, the comparing these uh, boards, um, yeah, there's not that many to say, that much to say about that slide. Um, you don't need to wonder why, also based on the same microcontroller, uh, so Ethernet 2 has more GPO lines because there is an additional multiplexer on it. And yeah, so for M, for NVRAM configuration data, here are, are in brackets because it's shared with, uh, or it's the same, actually it's the same flash chip also used for the bootloader stuff and kernels and applications. So, uh, if you're looking into a better systems, obviously power consumption is interesting. That's what I measured in reality. For the Ethernet 1, it's about one watts with the application I had to use or I developed as part of the SAT research project. Um, and the Ethernet 5 booted from an SD card with also an Ethernet link up is about two watts. So now the real interesting thing about these boards, in my opinion, is that uh, all layouts and schematics are um, distributed under BSD style license. In this case, you see the license of uh, the Ethernet 1. It's the same for the rest of them. I actually intended to use it, these schematics, to build my own version of an Ethernet 2. Unfortunately, that project was canceled. Um, yeah, these are all the links uh, for the respective layers and schematic files for the Eagle PCB design software. Um, the reason I collected them here is that they're a bit tricky to find because unfortunately most, most of them are only uh, found on the uh, German version of the homepage but not the English one. Um, something I forgot to say, uh, one nice feature of these families also is that they all have the yeah, pin compatible expansion port and there are some ready-made expansions you can find, for example the MediaNut which uh, is an MP3 decoder but if you Google around, you'll also find uh, other projects like uh, GPP, GPIB bus interface used for connecting measurement instruments. So there's also a template available, um, layouts and schematics template, if you want to build your own extensions. Yeah, so what about NatOS? Uh, it's a yeah, rather simple and small, but rather usable real-time operating system. It provides all features. You uh, expect them uh, expect them for a real-time operating system like cooperative multitasking, especially deterministic interrupt response times, and so on. It has support for all the typical communication protocols for IP. That's unfortunately currently only IP version four, but uh, IPv6 is in the works. Um, one nice thing also is that sort of use land, which is in real use land because it's using the same aerospace, is largely POSIX compliant. As you'll say later, it's also a rather simple to get used to it. Um, and I, for myself, also ported um, software or applications between um, yeah, NATO S and, and POSIX, and yeah, this is straightforward. And of course, NATO S itself is also BSD style licensed. One nice feature is also that the kernel is modular and like a library. 
So if you build an application based on it, you don't have uh, yeah, kernel with un or uh, yeah application with unused parts. It's only links in what actually is used. Uh, more features, obviously, uh, all the hardware of the Ethernet family of boards is supported. Uh, however, they also support some additional microcontrollers and uh, additional platforms. For example, actually, the Game Boy Advance is a supported platform. Some resources for another OS you should be aware of is, yeah, obviously, the sources. And, uh, yeah, as of now, of uh, the current stable version is 4.10.3, which is also the first, uh, first stable version to include um, support for FreeBSD host as a host, but uh, it's actually trivial to add support for other hosts like yeah, NetBSD and OpenBSD and so on. So Wiki is also rather good with lots of examples, background information and so on. And one real, really useful and, and usable thing is the API reference for NatOS, which explains about uh, yeah, any function you can call in detail. If you want to build NatOS for Ethernet 1 and 2, um, on, in this case, FreeBSD as a host, you need the following FreeBSD ports. Um, I didn't actually look whether Net and OpenBSD has the same ports, but I assume they have this or rather, rather common ports. First two are the toolchain for the RVR microcontroller. Uh, so you need additionally a libc for RVR, RVR, AVR. Uh, you need uh, typically a tool called AVR Dude for flashing these boards. And yeah, you also need some, some glue stuff, sort of. Um, it's um, talking about Lua. It's uh, also possible to actually run Lua scripts on these boards um, under NatOS, but that's something I haven't tried myself so far. Building, uh, yeah, installing NatOS is rather straightforward after you download the source and uh, yeah, you run configure. Two things you should uh, yeah, disable, in my opinion, is uh, the graphical uh, version of NatConf. Um, I don't think you actually need really need them. The command line version is basically fully uh, sufficient, and uh, uh, using the or adding the graphical versions just uh, just as a lot of uh, depends in bloat. Another thing uh, that's causing additional dependencies is the NAT discovery tool. Um, basically, that's a tool you can run to discover boards via Ethernet and. Uh, configure static, uh, static IP addresses of these boards then used with NatOS. If you need that feature, you actually yeah, need to build NAT discovery. Um, apart from that, you probably can save or spare set uh, dependencies. One thing you need to do is, after installing it, is to add the, uh, add the uh, binary path to your yeah, path environment. So two tools can be called. Um, in general, if you then want to build or yeah, stuff for uh, Ethernet 1 and 2, there are um, two methods, a so-called entry method and a build tree method. Entry method is sort of the old way, uh, like we configured kernels in, in FreeBSD where you see the user source uh, on uh, AMD64, for example, conf, and then run config on the kernel config file change the object and build it. So it's basically uh, building the objects within the source tree. The build, build tree method is something like the CD to use a source and run, make, build kernel, and build world. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the entry method uh, yeah, shown here is uh, more appropriate if you want to um, change NATOS itself, because you have, don't uh, constantly have to change directives from source tree to object or build tree. So if you want to configure NatOS for Ethernet 1 and 2, you typically run the NAT setup um, script, which is an interactive script that's uh, on the serial giving for Ethernet 1. So it's pr pretty much uh, what you um, use unchanged. Um, just depending on the ISP programmer you're using, you probably um, want to select another ISP protocol. In this case, I'm using the USB SP uh, protocol, which is rather common. You'll find several um, yeah, 
ISP programmer is using set protocol, typically self builds. This is one of these. It's a um, yeah, ISP to ISP programmer self build. You can get support for free from Harker Lighter Button if you send them stamps. And since it's about five to six euros in components. So only problem with this is you need to bootstrap it because it's um, also using a microcontroller itself. So if you have to, for one time, borrow an ISP programmer. If you have run that NAT setup script, this results in a bunch of files to be created. You probably should check in if you're using a local uh, source repository. There's one COVID currently. Um, not OS 4.10.3 uh, officially only supports GCC 4.3.2. However, um, currently in 3B support, we have 4.5.1. And they deprecated uh, a bit of stuff currently still used by Not OS. So you have to manu manually um, yeah, add a hack to the user conf file, which is um, adding to the hardware definition for level these two macro definitions and also these flags. So the currently deprecated uh, and not yet in not always replaced functions are uh, still available. And you also need a workaround for bug in the not always build system, which is the last line. Um, my fix for that got accepted upstream, but it's obviously not, not yet committed. Yeah, so to finally compile not OS, uh, you just run gmake clean all install. Uh, one caveat here is also if you're changing NatOS sources yourself, you have to rerun that last step and relink your application because on uh, NatOS build system unfortunately doesn't uh, catch changes in NatOS itself. So uh, if you then want to compile applications, there are several uh, example uh, applications uh, brought with even uh, the NatOS sources in Nat app. For example, an HDB daemon or an RS232 terminal server program. You just a CD to set um, directory, run again uh, gmake, basically all on it. And once you have done that, you can just run gmake burn to flash it onto the board via an ISP programmer. Uh, you have to watch out to have the necessary uh, permissions on the uh, device nodes used for flashing. Uh, in theory, for USB, it should be possible to do that via DevOps rules. For reasons unknown, I didn't manage to get that working, so I just set uh, the set you a bit on of, of AVR due so far. Yeah, that's on the typical Hello World example, how it looks like uh, in NatOS as a NatOS application. As I said before, it's rather familiar. Uh, if you know POSIX, uh, you have um, yeah, underscore IO control uh, for uh, yeah, setting, uh, in this case, uh, UART speed for the output device. And you have also stuff like uh, F open and regular open and so on. <coughs> Uh, here you also see how you register hardware devices within uh, NATOS. In this case, uh, you have some macro for the uh, um, debug or the con standard console interface. Uh, the following two parameters uh, in general are address and uh, interrupt. Uh, you need these parameters, for example, for the Mac controller, but not for zero devices. Um, Creating make files for NATOS is also rather simple. Basically, it's similar to the BST foo MK files. You basically just have to define the project variable. It has to match, and in this case, on hello, hello world.c. Uh, if you have additional sources, you would uh, add them here. Um, the rest you can just copy and paste. If you do that, you just have to watch out that uh, the RM lines here begin with uh, tabs and not with spaces. So, so far about uh, using NATOS for uh, Ethernet 1 and 2. For 3 and 5, we basically need just another build chain, uh, uh, tool chain, which are the ARM11 binutils and ARM11 GZ. Uh, you get these uh, within FreeBSD these ports by uh, combining the cross uh, binutils and GZ ports, setting target arch and the target ABI. Then, yeah, installing not is, is the same as for one and two. Uh, yeah, exactly the same. 
Then uh, in this case, I'm uh, yeah, showing how the build tree method works. It's a bit more complicated than the NAT setup one. You basically yeah, run NAT configure with a bunch of options, which then creates a build tree for NAT OS itself, which is called NAT build, yeah, in this case, 5OF. Uh, unfortunately, you can you need a hack uh, to make it work with current FreeBSD ports, which is the change in NutConf and case uh, name of the target binaries. Uh, I'm I'm not really sure about the background here. Uh, apparently, GCC and the Binutis guys decided to give yeah give some different names, and the FreeBSD ports haven't really caught up with that. And uh, you currently have to do that by hand. Maybe there's a better way to use the new lip stuff. Um, what? Mm, I'm not sure how the called, port is called. New lip, no. Yeah, whatever. Um, maybe it's a better way, but for now it's a hex that's working. Uh, unfortunately, the NutConf MK file says, uh, yeah, automatically create it, um, don't change, just ignore that. Yeah, once you have done that, you again can just uh, change the build tree for NatOS, run gmake uh, all again, and you end up with uh, NatOS compiled in the build tree. Then you have to do the same for an application's build tree, also running uh, nut configure with set arguments. Same hack again required here. And then if you want to build also example applications, you just uh, cd to the NetApp. Um, Build tree directory, run gmake again, and this results in a lot of uh, .bin files you can then uh, use on your Ethernet 5. Basically, also similarly for, for Ethernet 3. So, how do you flash or netboot on Ethernet 5? Uh, basic procedure is to use TFTP, so at you at least uh, need a TFTP server. I'll also advise to configure the boards via DHCP, that's is the snippet you'll need for as a IC DHCP daemon. Uh, that's especially handy if you uh, later on would like to netboot FreeBSD in order to give it a root path to the NFS, NFS root directory. So yeah, running TFTP daemon is um, rather straightforward um, currently. With uh, the BSD operating systems, all you typically have to change in the INAD conf is the path to the uh, NFS root, um, root direct boot directory you're intending to use, and afterwards just uh, yeah enable it in RC conf and, and start it. Uh, if you finally yes then connect to the zero port of an Ethernet five with uh, 115 kbps and yeah 8 and 1 and 8 and 1 you'll see um, typically see these boot messages uh, which the first line is uh, sign boot which is a first um, stage bootloader residing within that uh, integrated uh, flash second is uh, u boot stuff so that's also at the, as the Rafael pointed out, we are a bit cheating with my title because yeah, so far we have not OS which be still instance and the uh, hardware which is be still licensed, but U-boot is unfortunately GPL licensed. Then you get a bit of uh, image D message like stuff, and finally you get an auto boot sequence if you uh, yeah actually hit any key to to uh, stop it. You get to the U-boot prompt, and yes, then you can configure and uh, yeah, do different things. For example, alternatively to using using DHCP, you can um, set static IP address and a static IP address for the TFTP server. With the safe env command, you then can uh, save this environment variables, and also with printf, you can print all the environment. So how do you netboot uh, Ethernet 5? First off, you need again to have, yeah, obviously an up to OS application. In this case, I'm referring to the Hello World uh, shown earlier, which also works for the Ethernet 5, not just the Ethernet 1 and 2. Then, after putting it in the TFTP boot directory, you basically set an image name and run the TFTP boot NUT script, uh, which will cause the uh, um, application to be loaded via TFTP and then to be executed one time. 
If you want to do that uh, every time you power on the board, you can additionally set the, the boot command variable to uh, run that uh, script and save the environment again. Alternatively to net booting, uh, you can also store that uh, in the respective, respective partition in the 4 megabytes external flash using the TFTP install NAT script. Then, yeah, flashing takes a bit, but afterwards uh, you can, uh, yeah, also run it uh, again one time from the flash using the flash boot NAT script or again set boot command to do that every time you power it on. Yes, that's for NATO as so far. As for FreeBSD on Ethernet 5, uh, yeah, I, as of set revisions, I added support to it, or this is the last bits of, of support. Uh, it's also going to be in, in 9.1 release. Basically, uh, what it took to get FreeBSD running on Ethernet 5 was adding support for the some 9xe family of microcontrollers that was rather simply to do because we already support the core these microcontrollers are built on. Uh, so if just uh, yeah, uh, additional flash and apart from that it's, it's basically the same. So then there was a requirement for, the, for a new driver for the real-time clock chip used on uh, this uh, boards, also not that hard to do. And the real funny part was to fix a lot of drivers at, um, yeah, say, Verbucky in FreeBSD, but also needed uh, workarounds for silicon bugs of, yeah, certain Atmel microcontrollers, not only the SAM 9XE, but they also applying to other stuff. And, yes, yeah, so most interesting stuff was uh, uh, TUI is a two-wire interface controller, how Atmel calls their I2C controller, which just had no chance of working anywhere at all so far because it just doesn't, it didn't send a stop. I'll also like to thank uh, Ian Lepore from Symmetricom at this point, who especially contributed the fixes required for MMC, but also did, yeah, contributed uh, some other bits of these fixes and, and reviewed, reviewed uh, several of them. All in all, this should make FreeBSD the first operating system besides NATO S, of course, to, to support Ethernet 5 out of 3. As I said earlier, uh, it says official Linux support, but it's not in the Linux mainline. So how do you compile uh, userland? FreeBSD userland for Ethernet 5, basically, um, yeah, this example refers to 9.1, but it's also the same for head. It's straightforward how you build um, <coughs> within a cross environment. Um, so only thing to watch out is especially for head to pass the DMALOC, DM, uh, yeah, malloc production macro. Uh, because otherwise uh, some malloc um, debugging support will just blow a 128 megabytes system out of uh, yeah, the water, sort of. Um, so default kernel configuration file I'm shipping within FreeBSD is set up to do net booting. So if you don't want to do net booting but boot from an SD card instead, you have to replace in the kernel config file the uh, above lines with a uh, root dev name <laughs> option. And yeah, once I've done that, you can uh, regularly build again uh, and uh, cross build and, and curl by again setting a target to ARM, the giving the uh, kernel configuration um, na uh, config file name and run build kernel. Then, once you have built world and kernel for the Ethernet 5, uh, you have to, for an NFF root to install set, uh, yeah, objects by running the install kernel, install world, and distribution targets. Again, straightforward, as you do cross building, the only thing to watch out in this case is to set kernel underscore ko to kernel.bin because that's what you want to, yeah, boot on the boards and not the regular binary. Uh, called kernel. Afterwards, you probably want to disable send mail totally and enable SSHD on the boards. It's uh, done via yeah, calling uh, sys commands. And once 
you have done that, you're basically finished with, I think, an NFS route appropriate for Ethernet 5. I prepared that uh, for 9.1 RC2. Um, via on Torboard, you can download from the peoplefreebsd.org. And uh, basically, that's also the same for um, building a route that is intended to be placed on an MMC or SD card. Um, yes, and if you want to netboot FreeBSD, obviously you have for one time to make sure your NFS uh, server host is running, for example, like uh, in this case. Um, yes, and on the Ethernet 5 itself, we have to be have to do a bit of magic, uh, setting uh, environment variables and um, sort of uh, adding scripts. Um, most important ones is uh, running the power man on command to power on the per peripherals on the board. You also need to set some variables uh, used by yeah, other parts of the U-board support. In this case, start and end are not really needed for uh, netbooting, uh, just for flashing, but uh, the same uh, sort of script is also used for um, fl uh, flash booting from flash later on. Then you have to create a sort of script to um, boot FreeBSD via TFTP and in the end save all the environment. Once you have done that, uh, booting FreeBSD via network is as simple as running uh, TFTP boot FreeBSD. Or if you want to do again that uh, on every power up of the board, you can again um, alter the boot command variable to do that automatically. <laughs> if you want to uh, install FreeBSD on an SD card, um, basically what you do is buy a new card and that's how they typically look like. They have fat stuff on it. These are the usual commands to uh, delete what you find there. Uh, in general, you can do that as a bind for one time netbooting an Ethernet 5 part via um, network, or you can use one of those uh, MNC SD uh, adapters or readers, or as they called, also service for writing, and connect it to a regular PC and do that stuff there. That's how you create then, uh, yeah, UFS partitioning and file system used for uh, FreeBSD on the Ethernet 5. And once you have new fasted and, and mounted the file system on the SD card, you yeah, sort of install regularly uh, the userland uh, spit built earlier by, ent uh, by either setting the dust here or copying what you have over. Then again, if you want to uh, boot from that card, you have to again um, create some magic. So first part up to uh, creating select FreeBSD is the same as, as, as I've shown earlier for uh, uh, netbooting. Um, the only difference here then is a TFTP install FreeBSD script and then a flash boot FreeBSD script. Once it's done, uh, you can run TFTP install FreeBSD to boot via TFTP or load via TFTP the kernel. Um, and then it's flashed, which takes a while, about, I think, 20 to 30 seconds. Also, one problem here is um, that the Linux partition we are yeah, abusing for this is uh, limited to uh, 2.6 megabytes currently. That's a rather tight fit. And yeah, once you have FreeBSD on there, uh, it's a bit, in my opinion, simpler to flash this kernel. You can just use DD to set device. Yeah, as I said earlier, it takes a while to, for both methods to complete. Uh, also, we have to watch out to uh, use uh, the write kernel for SD booting. Um, as I said earlier, you have to set the root dev name as appropriate. And also, we have to fetch the kernel.bin file for that. Again, I've prepared, prepared a, such a kernel, which you can download from peoplefreebsd.org. Once you have flashed uh, the kernel to the board, it's again simple to run flash boot freebsd. And 
again by boot command altering you can do that automatically <coughs> on boot. Yeah, some to do's for FreeBSD on Ethernet 5, that's not that much stuff to do. Uh, currently we're missing a, a drive with a power management controller which allows to turn off certain parts of the board or peri peripherals on the board. Mm, it's, it's not hard to do. The main question is what will really happen if you just turn off the clock of the Ethernet controller. It's something to try and maybe uh, yeah, not provide. Then uh, getting new boat loader to work is certainly very desirable. As I said earlier, uh, we currently have a um, um, tight match with the kernel in flash. Uh, using new bootloader with circumvented probably also um, speed up boot times quite a bit. Um, I only looked at it um, for a short time. It didn't work out of the box, but uh, it could be that all that's required to get it working is to build a new bootloader image with the uh, config API stuff enabled. However, in general, for FreeBSD ARM, there's quite some stuff to do. So eight, um, eight drivers, um, network interface driver for the embedded uh, Mac uh, should be improved. For one, uh, it's laid out for all the controllers which need to um, copy the received data to MBUS with uh, especially the same nine uh, version of microcontrollers. You can directly receive into MBUF. That's something you really want for speed. And also, uh, I discovered a reliability problems with the driver. Uh, for TCP, it's just working fine. However, for um, UDP, um, for example, when copy, copying large amounts of data via, uh, via NFS, um, it sometimes just wedges and you can't recover. So I have no idea for what's uh, problem really is, but that's also something that needs to be fixed, but isn't really Ethernet 5 specific. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to do in the SPI land. Uh, mainly, we're currently looking, uh, lacking a way to uh, let client device drivers say what the hardware uh, supports in speed. Um, currently, uh, we just can uh, assume that only the lowest one possible that is supported. We need a framework to tell uh, the upper layers what the maximum hardware really supports. Also for the AT91 SPI controller implementations, there's some strange bug I haven't mentioned, nailed down so far, that um, when actually using speed supported by the hardware, or uh, yeah, higher speed supported by the hardware, I get to get data corruption, so only uh, working variant currently is to uh, run it uh, uh, lowest possible speed. That's also not very desirable. Uh, there's room for improvement in the machine dependent bus DMA implementation, uh, especially regarding cache flushing. There are some corner cases not caught currently. Uh, USB is rather problematic at that point point in time, um, some while ago, there were some changes, changes which blow uh, the arm and mid support off the, out of the water because um, it's not really using uh, bus DMs the way intended, but even before that breakage, uh, it wasn't stable on arm. Um, it worked for simple stuff like uh, RS232 controllers, but uh, if you try to mount a file system or use a file system via OSP, sooner or later that stuff blows up. Um, also, uh, thankfully, we finally got the NAND framework, and as I said earlier, the Ethernet 5 ports um, provide one gigabyte of flash for a file system. That's currently not usable within FreeBSD, and yeah, we also need a driver to hook up the Atmel part with that framework. I haven't looked at it, it how complicated it would be, would, uh, it be to yeah, implement that. I hopefully will to get it, will get to it sometime. Or maybe someone else would also be great. Yeah, that's everything from my part so far. Um, I'd like to yeah, thank the organizers to select my talk. Yeah, and as I said earlier, I am the poor for also contributing some fixes here. 
Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Are we still need to um, malloc production for 9.1? No, um, maybe I wasn't really clear about that. Uh, in the stable branches, we are um, by default disabling it. But if you build head, as you probably know yourself, you really need that it won't work. I just wanted to give a sort of a universal command which works for both stable and, and head branches. Sorry if it wasn't clear before. I'm also sorry if the talk was a uh, yeah, lot of information in, in, in less time. As I said earlier, uh, it would be nice if I had um, yeah, just to a uh, chance to write a paper for it and put more information there. But uh, yeah, thanks to the video guys, uh, you can download the talk probably later and, and um, take your time to, to have a look at the slides and, and listen to the audio stream. Yo, then thanks for attending.